I now give the floor to His Excellency, uh, Minister of Foreign Affairs of Cuba, His Excellency Bruno Eduardo Rodriguez Perea. You have the floor. Señor Presidente. Mr. President, distinguished heads of state and government, distinguished delegates, I would like to convey my sincere condolences to the Commonwealth of the Bahamas for the loss of lives and the terrible destruction caused by Hurricane Dorian. I call upon the international community to mobilize resources in order to provide assistance. Mr. President, I denounce before the General Assembly of the United Nations that the government of the United States has, in recent months, begun to apply criminal, non-conventional measures to prevent the provision of fuel to our country from different markets through threats and persecution of the countries that transport a fuel, flag states, states of registration, and shipping and insurance companies. As a result, we have faced severe difficulties to ensure the supply of fuel required for the everyday life of the country and we've been forced to, to adopt uh, temporary measures that only could be applied in a well-organized country with a unified uh, people who, in solidarity, are prepared uh, to defend themselves from foreign aggressions and preserve the social justice that has been achieved. In this past year, the government of the United States has steadily ramped up its hostile actions and blockade against Cuba. It has been setting up additional obstacles to foreign trade and increased the persecution of our banking and financial relations with the rest of the world. It has extremely restricted travel, as well as any kind of interaction between both peoples. It has also hindered relations and contacts of Cubans living in the United States with their home country. Until today, the strategy of imperialism against Cuba, the infamous memorandum issued in 1960 by former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State Lester Mallory, and I quote, there is no effective political opposition. The only foreseeable means of alienating internal support from the government is through disenchantment and disaffection based on economic dissatisfaction and hardship. Every possible means should be promptly undertaken to weaken economic life. Denying money and supplies to Cuba to decrease monetary and real wages, to bring about hunger, desperation, and overthrow of government. The Illegal Helms-Burton Act of 1996 guides the aggressive behavior of the United States against Cuba. Its essence is a stark attempt to question Cuba's right to free self-determination and independence as a nation. It likewise envisages the imposition of U.S. legal authority and the jurisdiction of U.S. courts over Cuba's commercial and financial relations with any country, thus riding roughshod over international law and the national jurisdiction of Cuba and third states, while establishing the alleged supremacy of the law and the political will of the United States over them. The economic commercial and financial blockade continues to be the main obstacle to the development of our country and the advancement of the process to update the socialist, economic, and social development model that our country has designed for itself. 
New measures particularly affect the non-state sector of our economy. Every year, the United States devotes tens of millions of dollars from the federal budget to political subversion with the purpose of creating confusion and weakening the unity of our people, which is articulated with a well-coordinated propaganda campaign aimed at discrediting the revolution, its leaders, and its glorious historic legacy, denigrating the economic and social policies that support development and justice, and destroying the ideas of socialism. Last Thursday, on the base of gross slanders, the State Department announced that the first secretary of the Communist Party of Cuba, Army General Raul Castro Ruz, would not be granted a visa to enter this country. This is an action that is devoid of any practical effect. It is aimed at offending Cuba's dignity and the sentiments of our people. It is a, a vote-catching crumb being tossed to the Cuban-American extreme right. However, the open, offensive fal falsehoods that are being used in an attempt to justify them, which we strongly reject, reflect the baseness and rot which this U.S. administration resorts to as it drowns in a sea of corruption, lies, and immorality. All these actions and behaviors are infringements of international law and violations of the United Nations Charter. The most recent excuse, repeated right here last Tuesday by President Donald Trump, was to blame Cuba for the failed plan to overthrow the Bolivarian government of Venezuela with the purpose of ignoring the strength of the Venezuelan people, Yankee spokespeople repeat over and over again the vile slander that our country has between 20 to 25,000 troops in Venezuela and that Cuban imperialism exercises control over Venezuela. Just a few minutes before that, the president of Brazil, at this very podium, read a script of false allegations drafted in Washington, which increased that shameless lie to around 60,000 Cuban troops in Venezuela. As part of its anti-Cuban obsession, the current U.S. administration, echoed by Brazil, is attacking international medical cooperation programs that Cuba shares with tens of developing countries, the most needy communities, based on a feeling of solidarity and the free and voluntary will of hundreds of thousands of Cuban professionals, which are being implemented in accordance with cooperative agreements signed with the governments of the countries receiving that assistance, and for many years, they have enjoyed the recognition of the international community, of this uh, very organization, the United Nations, and the World Health Organization as being the best example of South-South cooperation. As a result, many Brazilian communities were deprived of free quality health care, which uh, was offered by thousands of Cuban professionals under the More Doctors program. This period has not been free of the most shameless threats or blackmail or immoral invitations to our country to betray its principles and international commitments in exchange for oil under preferential conditions and questionable friendships. In commemorating the 60th anniversary of the triumph of the Re revolution, when Cubans achieved true final independence, First Secretary Raul Castro said, and I quote, 
we Cubans are ready to resist a situation of confrontation which we do not desire. And we hope that the clearest minds in the government of the United States could avoid it." End quote. We have reiterated that even under present circumstances, we will not give up our determination to develop a civilized relationship with the United States based on mutual respect and the recognition of our deep differences. We know that this is our people's wish and the feelings which most uh, of the people of the United States share, as well as the Cubans living in this country. I also confirm that economic aggression, no matter how difficult it may be, no matter how harsh the threats and blackmail are, will not extract a single concession from us. Those who are familiar with the history of Cuba during its long struggle to achieve emancipation and the steadfast defense of the freedom and justice that the Cuban people have conquered will understand beyond any doubt the significance, the sincerity, and the authority of these strong beliefs and ideas which our people treasure. Mr. President, bilateral relations between Cuba and Venezuela are based on mutual respect and true solidarity. We support, without any hesitation, the legitimate government headed by uh, Comrade Nicolas Maduro Moros and the civic and military unity of the Bolivarian Chavista people. We condemn the behavior of the United States government against Venezuela, focused on encouraging coup d'etats, assassination of the country's leaders, economic warfare, and sabotage of power generation plants. We reject the implementation of unilateral coercive measures and the plundering of, the, of Venezuela's assets, companies, and export revenues. These actions are a serious threat to regional peace and security, as well as a direct attack on the Venezuelan people, who they attempt uh, to break in the cruelest way. We call on everyone to raise awareness of these facts and call for the cessation of unilateral coercive measures, reject the use of force, and encourage a respectful dialogue with the government of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela based on the principles of international law and constitutional order in Venezuela. A few days ago, the United States and a handful of countries decided to reactivate the obsolete Inter-American Treaty of Reciprocal Assistance, which envisages the use of military force. This is an absurd decision, which jeopardizes regional peace and security, while through a legal trick uh, pretends to justify interference in the inter internal affairs of the Bolivarian Republic of Venezuela. It is also a gross violation of the proclamation of Latin America and the Caribbean as a zone of peace, which the heads of state and government of Latin America and the Caribbean signed in Havana in January 2014. Of similar significance is the U.S. decision to revive the nefarious Monroe Doctrine, an instrument to dominate through imperialism under which several military interventions and innovations, coup d'etats, military dictatorships, and the most atrocious crimes were perpetrated in our Americas. As we saw a few days ago in this assembly, the United States president habitually attacks socialism in his public statements with a clear electoral purpose while promoting a McCarthyist intolerance of those who believe in the possibility of a better world and who entertain the hope of living in peace in sustainable harmony with nature and in solidarity with everyone else. President Trump ignores or tries to conceal the fact 
that neoliberal capitalism is responsible for increasing social and economic inequality, affecting even the most developed societies today. Given its nature, neoliberal capitalism fosters corruption, social marginalization, increased crime, racial intolerance, and xenophobia. Trump forgets or ignores the fact that capitalism begot fascism, apartheid, and imperialism. The government of the United States leads a gross persecution of political leaders and popular and social movements through defamation campaigns and outrageous manipulation and politically motivated legal processes to take back con uh, to uh, take back sovereign control over natural national resources and the gradual elimination of social differences policies that made it possible to build more just and uh, fraternal societies becoming a way out of the economic and social crisis and a hope for the peoples of the Americas. This is what they did with former Brazilian President Luiz Ignacio Lula da Silva, whose freedom we demand. We reject Washington's attempts to destabilize the government of Nicaragua and ratify our unswerving solidarity with President Daniel Ortega. We express our solidarity with the nations of the Caribbean who call for legitimate reparations of the horrendous uh, history of slavery, as well as the just, special, and differentiated treatment they deserve. We ratify our historic commitment with free determination and independence of the brother people of Puerto Rico. We support Argentina's legitimate claim for its rights of sovereignty over the Malvinas, South Georgia, and South Sandwich Islands. Mr. President, the behavior of the current United States administration and its strategy of military and nuclear domination are a threat to international peace and security. The United States uh, maintains almost 800 military bases around the world. It promotes projects to militarize outer space and cyberspace, as well as covert and illegal use of information and communication technologies to attack other states. The withdrawal of the United States from the Treaty on the Elimination of uh, Medium-Range and Shorter-Range Nuclear m Missiles and uh, the uh, prompt uh, beginning of testing of uh, middle-range missiles are intended to launch a new arms race. The President of the Councils of State and Ministers, Miguel Díaz-Canel Bermúdez, said before this assembly last year, and I quote, the exercise of multilateralism and full respect for the principles and rules of international law to advance towards a multipolar, democratic, and equitable world are necessary to ensure peaceful coexistence, preserve international peace and security, and find lasting solutions to systematic uh, to systemic rather problems. We reiterate our full and restricted support to a comprehensive, just and lasting solution to the conflict between Israel and Palestine, based on the creation of two states so that the Palestinian people can exercise their right to free self-determination and have an independent and sovereign state based on pre-1967 borders with East Jerusalem as its capital. We reject the unilateral action of the United States to establish its diplomatic mission in the city of Jerusalem. We condemn the violence of Israeli forces against civilians in Palestine and the threat of annexation of the occupied territories of the West Bank. We reaffirm our unswerving solidarity with the Sahrawi people 
and our support uh, to a solution to the question of the Western Sahara so that they can exercise their right to self-determination and to live in peace in their own territory. We support the quest for a peaceful, negotiated solution to the situation imposed on Syria without any foreign interference, with full respect for its sovereignty and territorial integrity. We reject any direct or indirect intervention without the consent of the legitimate authorities of Syria. We express our solidarity with the Islamic Republic of Iran faced uh, with the aggressive escalation of the United States. We reject the unilateral withdrawal of the United States from the Iran nuclear agreement. We call for dialogue and cooperation based on the principles of international law. We welcome the process of dialogue between the two Koreas. It is only through dialogue without uh, preconditions and negotiations that it will be possible to achieve a lasting political solution in the Korean Peninsula. We emphatically condemn the imposition of unilateral unfair sanctions against the Democratic People's Republic of Korea. The continued expansion of NATO to the Russian borders creates grave dangers which are further aggravated by the arbitrary sanctions that we reject. Mr. President, we support with admiration the, rice, the recent uh, students' march uh, in New York. Climate change, some of uh, whose effects are already irreversible, are a matter of sur uh, threaten uh, the very survival, particularly that of small developing island states. Capitalism is unsustainable. It's irrational, unsustainable production and consumption patterns, as well as the growing unjust concentration of wealth, are the main threat to the ecological balance of the planet. There can be no sustainable development without social justice. Special differentiated treatment of the countries of the South in international economic relations can no longer be overlooked. The emergency in the Amazon compels us to seek solutions through cooperation, the cooperation of all without exclusion or politicization and with full respect for the sovereignty of states. Mr. President, the corruption of political systems and electoral systems is proliferating. These systems are increasingly distant from the will of the people. Powerful, exclusive minorities, particularly corporate groups, decide on the nature and composition of governments, parliaments, justice systems, and law enforcement bodies. After the failure of the U.S. government's attempt to submit it, the Human Rights Council to its will, the U.S. decided to withdraw to hinder international dialogue and cooperation and human rights even further. This should not surprise us. The United States is a country where human rights are systematically violated very often in a deliberate, blatant fashion. 36,000 people, 100 every day, died in the United States in 2018 because of firearms, while the government protects the producers and vendors of firearms at the cost of the safety of its citizens. 91,000 U.S. citizens die of heart disease every day in the United, uh, or rather, 91, uh, every year unnecessarily. Afro-American uh, infant and maternal mortality is double that of the white population. 28 million people have no medical insurance or no real access to health care. 32 
million U.S. citizens are functionally illiterate. They cannot read or write. 2.2 million U.S. citizens are incarcerated. 4.7 million are under are free on probation, and 10 million arrests happen every year. It is understandable why the president spends his time attacking socialism. We reject the politicization, selectivity, punitive approaches, and double standards in addressing the issue of human rights. Cuba will remain committed to the realization of the rights of all people and all peoples to peace. The exercise of all human rights, particularly the right to peace, to free self-determination and to development. We must prevent the imposition of a single totalitarian overpowering cultural model that destroys national cultures, identities, history, memory, symbols, and individuality, and that silences the structural problems of capitalism that lead to ever-increasing, ever-more painful inequality. So-called cognitive capitalism offers the same thing. Digital capitalism is at the top of world value chains. It concentrates property of digital data. It exploits identity, information, and knowledge. And it endangers the already analogically diminished freedom and democracy of the peoples. We need uh, to develop new kinds of humanistic and counter-hegemonic thinking of our own as well as decisive political action to articulate popular mobilization in networks, in, streets, in the streets, and at the ballot box. Independent states must exercise their sovereignty over cyberspace. They must uh, discard the illusion of the so-called network society or the, time, the era of access, and they must democratize internet governance and access. Mr. President, the powerful, universal thinking of the apostle of Cuba's independence, José Martí, continues to inspire and encourage the new generations of Cubans. The words of José Martí, written a few hours before he was killed in combat, are particularly relevant today, and I quote, Every day now, I am in danger of giving my life for my country and for my duty. In order to prevent, uh, in time, through the independence of Cuba, to prevent the United States from extending its hold across the Caribbean and f falling with ever greater force on the lands of our Americas, all I have done until now is t to that end." End quote. A similar power is in the words of Antonio Maceo in 1988, and I quote, Whoever tries to conquer Cuba will only gather the dust of her blood-soaked soil if they do not perish in the struggle. End quote. This is the very same, the sole Cuban revolution commanded by Fidel Castro Ruz, now headed by First Secretary Raul Castro, and President Miguel Díaz-Canel. And if, at this point, anybody is still attempting to force the Cuban re revolution to surrender, or hoping that new generations of Cubans will betray their past and renounce their future, we will repeat with the same emphasis of Fidel, homeland or death, we shall overcome. For the Minister of Cuba, for his statement.